All right, good morning, Eastern Heights. We're so glad you're here to worship with us today. Everybody's looking good. Thank you for being here. Would you please stand as we begin our service uh, with a call to worship from Psalm 73. This is uh, God himself calling us to worship him, to gather together. Uh, Psalm 73. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. One, two, one, two, ready, go. It's coming on the clouds. It's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Amen. You may be seated. 
Good morning. Good to see you guys as we gather together for worship. Some of you may have seen this on our Facebook page. It's going to be uh, being sent out in our email letter, so we'll have more information uh, for you about this. But sometime back, our Great Commission team, this is the team that plans the, the meals to go out to Haven House as well as our smaller mission trips that we do, began the process of looking at buying what's called a baby box for our community. Now, can I explain the baby box to you real quick? Is All of us have heard these horrible stories about people abandoning children in dumpsters and other areas. Safe Haven, an organization, came up with a solution for this, and it is a, a box that a mother can go and they can leave the baby there. Uh, the boxes are built at fire stations. And as soon as the baby's put in there, that's a safe location for them. Immediately, uh, silent alarms go off that notify people of the child there. And they're able to go and get the baby and get it to a safe location. So this allows the mother to be able to drop off the child and the child to be kept safe. Our Great Commission team a long time ago began this process, began talking to the city well, just this week, we finally got the okay from the city to do this. As a matter of fact, the city is really excited about doing it. Uh, these are not located in a lot of places, but uh, as a matter of fact, I think only three or four states in the country have these, but a lot of them are Indiana. So we are now going to be able to have one located in the city of Jeffersonville. Not only has the city approved, yeah, that is something to get excited about. Not only has the city approved it, but an anonymous donor has come forward and agreed to pay for 50%. So the, the boxes and the hookup cost about $16,000. So they've agreed to come forward with that. Eastern Heights has committed to pay the rest of it. Well, we just immediately, we thought this is something that needs to be done. It, it needs, we need to respond, and this is an opportunity that God's put before us. We want to invite you, since you are Eastern Heights, to be a part of that. And so if you would like to contribute to that, if you, you put that on your offering envelope or you can go online and you can do it, you can make a donation, put on a baby box or safe haven, and we will get it to the right location to have this happen. You're going to be hearing more about it in the weeks to come as we get closer uh, to this being placed in. It's going to be placed in one of our fire uh, stations. We're not sure which one yet. But I, want to, I just want to commend our Great Commission team for the work that they've done. They've done a lot of this behind the scenes and quietly because they didn't want to say anything until they knew for sure it was going to happen. But if you're on the Great Commission team, I know not everybody's here, but if you're on the Great Commission team, would you stand up for us so that we can recognize you guys? So thank you. So this is the stuff that they're doing uh, for the Lord. So would you guys join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, just as we get the opportunity to be involved in what you're doing. We're not the ones who did it. You're the one that did it. You laid it on the heart of one of the team members. And as they met together as a team and they prayed about it, you just confirmed in their hearts this was something to be done. And as you, as you moved on their hearts, Lord, you moved on the hearts of people in the city. You opened up opportunities. You moved on another to help provide part of the, the amount for it. And now, Lord, you move on us to participate. God, this is just a reminder to us that too often when people look around and they, they panic and they think, where's God? And the world's just falling apart. It's one more reminder to us that you're not done. You haven't stopped. You're in control. You are at work. And what you're calling for us is not for us to try to control everything or make everything right, but what you're calling for us to do is to respond to what you're doing and to move when you say move and give when you say give. And Lord, we just thank you that we can be a part of what you're doing, but we thank you even more for the reminder that you are in control. We don't have to live in fear. So God, this morning as we worship you, as we sing, as we delve into your word, as we sometimes hear things we don't necessarily like to hear, let us be reminded that we don't have to be scared of those things. We need to respond to them and to know that you are sovereign and in control 
and at work. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to celebrate and worship God in music. Amen. Would you please stand once again as we continue with Great is Thy Faithfulness. a new song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. This is a meditation on our unity in Christ, that He is in us, and we are in Him, and every blessing, every good thing that we can do is only through Him. And Galatians 2.20 says this same thing, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. What gift of grace 
Is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I but through Christ in me. The night is dark. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me, through the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave say to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus now and ever is my Oh, the chains are released, I can see, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory. My lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I. Through Christ in me. Let's pray.
pray together. Heavenly Father, we look to you knowing that you have provided everything we need. In Christ, you have given us eternal life, eternal security. You've given us forgiveness. You've given us your spirit. You pour out blessing upon blessing, day after day, season after season. God, thank you. We celebrate your love. We gather here to celebrate your grace. And we pray, God, that as we turn to your word, that you would renew us by the truth, renew our minds, and, and let your word be planted deep within us, that it would bear fruit. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Take your Bibles, open up to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 11. We're continuing our look at the book of James. As I've said before, the book of James is a very practical book, and therefore at times it makes us very uncomfortable. Uh, we, we like some of the other stuff that's kind of flowery that's written or makes us feel good about ourselves, but James really hits us where we're at. Uh, we, we've noticed a few things. Let me remind you some of the things that we've noticed. We've seen that anger does not produce righteousness. We've seen that a, a lack of mercy causes favoritism. We've seen that our language can make our faith seem worthless. We've seen that an immature faith does not produce goodness. If you want to be godly, you want to be doing things that are good, you need to be maturing in your faith. And we saw last week that a, a sinful desire is what causes fighting. Now you may notice a theme running through here. The theme running through here is that the problem is you. It's not other people. It's not other things. The problem is you. And that's what makes James so uncomfortable because we'd much rather blame other people and say, look at their hypocrisy. Look at their sinfulness. But James is saying, no, you need to look at you and deal with you. And so he continues that as we get to chapter 4 here, verse 11, that he takes on another issue for us. So chapter, 11, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 says this, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Now let me break this down. This is, this is a verse with a lot of meaning in it, so let's just kind of take it apart. So the first thing, I'll, let's just start that first part. It says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Now, what is slander? Well, we know that slander is to say a lie about somebody that damages their character or damages their reputation. So that's, that's what slander is, saying a lie about somebody that's going to damage their character or reputation. No-brainer, right? I mean, that, that, obviously, don't lie. We, we should perfectly understand that. And yet James has got to write down, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has got to write down in this letter that 2,000 years later we're reading, is having to remind us that slander is unacceptable for Christians. The Christians should not slander others. We shouldn't slander fellow Christians, because he says that brothers and sisters, and so he's talking to Christians here. We shouldn't slander non-Christians. Now, if he has to take the time to say this, why? Because people are continuing to do it. I mean, you, you understand that you have to put warnings on things because people did it. And now you have to tell them, don't do it. It's, it's like I just bought a new pair of shoes recently, and inside my shoes is a little packet. And the packet says, do not eat. They have to tell you not to do that because somebody has said, hmm, I'm hungry. I think I'll go look for food inside a shoe. It's like being in Coles in the shoe department going, you need new shoes? No, I'm just hungry. What do you got? They're doing this. They're slandering. Now, you may say, okay, okay, they're slandering. Yes, yeah, slandering's going on. But what's the big deal? What's it? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I, 
we, we know the other person's a bad person. And I'm just kind of adding to a little white lie so everybody knows how bad they are. Well, let's find out. So he goes on in the verse. He says this. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges and speaks against the law and judging it. Now, he's, he's dealing a lot here with Christians treating Christians. And he, and he says here that not only is slander, when you're doing it, not only are you lying about someone that damaged their character and their reputation, but he says you are standing in condemnation. You are standing in judgment of them. So it's just not simply that you're saying something that's not true. You, you are you're making a judgment on them. Now, let me talk about judgment here for a second. There's a popular saying in society that says this. It says that only God can judge me. And you know what? That's true. Only God can judge you. As a matter of fact, he has judged us. He's written it down in a book. He's given it to us. And you can read it. And you can read the judgment. And you can read the verdict in it. And you can also read how to get out of that judgment. And so God has said that and he's shared that. So what is the role of the Christian in that? Well, the Christian's job is to warn others about what God has said and then to allow them to repent and then celebrate when they repent and they come to that decision. We are not writing the laws. We do not get to say what is right or wrong. God is the judge. He is the only judge. But we have this responsibility to share what God has said. We cross the line when we start adding to it or we start taking away. Now, there's passages in the Bible that talk about judging. But in all those passages, I think particularly about where Paul writes to the church in Corinth. So all of 1 Corinthians, you go, man, there's a lot of judgment in that. But all of that is Paul going back to the Scriptures and saying, this is what the Scriptures are saying. Not go set up your own opinions on what you think. So that's a problem with the church in Corinth, which is a sermon in itself, but the church in Corinth was going about creating their own personal opinions on how to do stuff, and Paul had to remind them that it is the Scriptures that shares it. So those times as we as Christians, and we see another Christian disobeying, we don't go and pass judgment on them. We don't condemn them. We come to them and say, hey, let me remind you what the Word of God says. And, hey, let me encourage you to repent. And, hey, let me celebrate with you when you do. Because you know what? At some point, you're going to need to come get me. That's what we're doing. We're not playing the role of judge. But slander is not only lying. It's deciding to start passing this judgment on somebody. It's saying that I, not God, will get to determine what the law says, and I, not God, will get to determine how the law applies to people. Now, this, this wanting to judge others very much fits into our sin nature, but it doesn't fit with the Scriptures. So let me kind of give you an illustration to kind of explain this. Let's say there are two people in a church, and there are the Thai people and there's the non-Thai people, right? And the Thai people, I'm going to join the Thai people here. One of the Thai people says, you know, those no Thai people over there, they don't wear ties because they think that ties are silly. And you know what else? Because they think ties are silly, they aren't Christians. Slander? Well, you go over and you talk to the non-tie person, and the non-tie person says, well, hold on. It is true I don't wear a tie. And it is true that some people who don't wear ties don't wear ties because they think they're silly. But not all people who don't wear ties think that. Some people don't wear ties because they're uncomfortable. And some people don't wear ties because they don't own a tie. But even more important, whether I wear a tie or don't wear a tie, has nothing to do with my salvation. My salvation is based on grace and grace alone. But when we start playing that role of judging, when we start taking that role of God, we start dictating not only the things that we like, but we judge the other person. So notice the Thai guy, Thai guy over here, said a lie about the non-Thai guy. He said that all non-Thai people think ties are silly. But not all non-Thai people think that. And then he took it a step further to, to push his point 
by saying, and those who think tithes are silly aren't really Christians. He's playing the role of the judge. And so James picks up on that and he says this. He goes, when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you are sitting in judgment. He says, when you slander another believer, when you play that role of judge, when you start determining whether or not they're a real Christian, now he's talking Christians among Christians, okay? So the people are Christians, but the other group is telling them that they're not Christians because they're not fitting what they think. He says, what you have become, you're the one really breaking the law. So Thai guy over here thinks that non-Thai guy is breaking the law because he doesn't wear a tie, and therefore he says they all think they're silly and they're not Christians. Guess what? He is the one really breaking the law. So when we start to slander, when we say something that isn't true about somebody, that damages their reputation, their character, it's not that we're just saying a lie about them. We have now stepped into the role of playing judge. We're trying to take God's place. And not only are we taking God's place, but we are distorting the gospel message. We are saying that salvation is something other than what is said in the scriptures. And we, when we do this, become the law breaker. You know, you may say, well, what law am I breaking? Well, the law that says, do not change the Scriptures. A couple of places you can look for that if you have time. Revelations 22, 18 and 19. Proverbs 30, 5 and 6. Isaiah 48. The, the entire book of Galatians <laughs> deals with this. Matthew 24, 35, James, as we've already seen in chapter 1, of verse 17, 21. Deuteronomy 12, 32 says this. Everything I command you, you shall be careful to do, and hear this, and you shall not add or take away from it. Now that's pretty bad. Now we're seeing slander in a far bigger picture than just saying something about somebody that's not necessarily true. We now see it playing the role of judgment, and we now see it distorting the gospel. But let me tell you how it gets even worse. So Thai guy is over here, and I like ties. I'm not picking on ties, but Thai guy says, those no Thai people over there, they think ties are silly, and they're not really Christians. And standing over here is a non-Christian. Now, what did the non-Christian just hear the Thai guy say? He just heard him say, the way you are saved is by wearing a tie. Is that the way you are saved? No, that's not the way you are saved. But all the time as Christians, when we go about and we are slandering, we are not only playing judge and telling a fellow brother and sister in Christ that they are not really a Christian because they don't fit up what we want. We are telling non-people how not to get saved. See, you, you don't get saved by what you wear or what you eat or what group you're a part of. You are saved by grace and grace alone through the work of Jesus Christ as revealed in the Scriptures to the glory of God. And when we start slandering, we can say, well, Chris, it's just a little lie. No, it is not telling people how to be saved. And it is causing disunity in the church and you, where you're trying to play the judge and be the judge, are really bringing judgment on yourself because you're taking the gospel message, the most important message in the world, and you are distorting it so that the people who need to hear it are not hearing it. And so James goes on in verse 12 to drive this point home. He says, listen, there is only one lawgiver. There is only one judge. There is only one person who's able to save. There's only one person who's able to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, James is not saying that we don't need to have human judges and authority. Don't take this and say we don't have any judges. or authority. We need to have civil judges, right? We, we have to have authority. We have authority in the church. We have authority in our community. You have to have that to have a civilized society. 
We have, we have authority in the home with the parents. That's all biblical. It's all scriptural. But in all those cases, in those cases with the judges and the, and the parents and the church leaders, all of them, especially their Christians, need to be acting justly and they need to be going back to the scriptures. That's over and over again. When the Bible talks about authority, it talks about going back to the scriptures. But when we slander, when we point people away from God, we instead bring judgment ourselves. The whole thing starts, the whole thing that slandering begins because we want to pass judgment on somebody else. But when we choose to slander and we choose to go down that road, the person really getting the judgment is us. The judgment comes on us. It all started off just a little bit of slander. I don't like this person. I don't like what they did. I don't like where they stand. I don't like their ideas. So I'm going to slander them. And my whole point is to get rest of people in line with me. But it's so deadly. Because you start trying to play God's role, which, by the way, God's not giving up his seat. All right? He's not going to let you take his place. And you distort the gospel message, which is the most important thing. And you mislead people on how to come to be saved. Now you understand why James has to say, don't slander. But you don't understand what the other person is saying about me. Don't slander. You don't, I got I to speak up and I got to say, don't slander. It's not worth it. And then to help us out, not only does James say that we should not slander, and by the way, he's saying this on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not James just making it up. He reminds us that there's another side to slander that we need to watch out for. See, slander is to lie about somebody so as to put them down. But boasting is to lie about yourself to bring yourself up. There's two ways of dealing with stuff, right, in, the, in our sinful nature. I can attack the person and put them beneath me who I don't like, who I see as a threat, and then I can lie about myself and I can raise myself up. So he deals with boasting here just if we decide to go that route instead. He says, now listen, you say today or tomorrow we'll go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then, then vanishes. James, James is reminding us that we are mortal beings, that we're, we're caught in time. You know, we can't see the future. And we have selected memories of the past. I mean, trust me, if we could see the future, we'd all own stock in GameStop, right? Some of you are like, I don't know what it is, but I wish I'd bought stock in it. And memories, we have selected memories of the past. If you don't think that you have selected memories of your past, if you have kids, sit down with your kids. In the back of your mind, think about some of the best experiences you've ever had as a family. Then ask your kids, say, what are your favorite memories of us as parents? And after about 15 minutes of them telling you every horrible thing that you ever did, you'll understand you have a selected memory you be like, I remember all the times we had family time to go, wasn't that great? And the kids are like, that was the most boringest thing on earth. We hated it. But we, we block those things out. We don't know the future and we don't really understand the past. And James is not saying that you shouldn't plan to go do stuff. He's not saying don't. I mean, the Bible speaks a lot about making plans and counting the cost and understanding what you're going to do. He's, he's not against any of that. But he says, well, when we think that we're in control, when we think we know the future, we think we understand the past, we set ourselves up for disappointment. We have these grand expectations that are going to happen, and then our expectations aren't met. And then we become bitter, and we become angry, and we become resentful. I'm going to save up money, and then when I retire, I'm going to go do this. And then a medical crisis comes up. And what happens? We thought we were in control. We kind of over-evaluated, over-inflated who we are in our control. And we become bitter and angry. And this resentment is like, we, we can't be sharing the gospel if you're consumed with bitterness and anger. You can't be praising God. We have expectations that, that you know, relationships going to work out great. And it doesn't. 
And we think we're in control of that. We're not. And we get bitter and angry, resentful. And what James is saying here is you can make your plans, you can go to your city, you can, you can make your money, but don't forget this. God, not you, is in control. Don't build yourself up. Don't lie about yourself and think you're so great and here's what you're going to do and here's what's going to happen. Don't overestimate your influence in the world or you will be setting yourself up for disappointment. And the solution is not to take an attitude of fatalism or take an attitude of despair, but instead to look elsewhere. Where should I then look? And he says this, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and do that. Now, this is not like a, a knock on wood sort of thing. You know, sometimes we feel, okay, knock on wood, you know, just in case it works out. This is a reality statement of life. He's saying, be aware that you're not in control, but there is one who is, the maker of heaven and earth, the almighty God, the Lord of all, and he has things under control. Let me share with you three things that I often remind myself when dealing with that, that desire to boast. The first thing I remind myself is I recognize there is a God, and, it's, and I say, and Chris, you are not it. All right? Yeah, yeah, I have to say that a lot to myself. I say, there's a God, and you're not it. You're not the God of the house. You're not the God of the neighborhood. You're not the God of the church. You're not God. All right? Now, I recognize that there's God. And I recognize he's in control. But I got to remember that I'm not it. The second thing I remind myself is I need to grow daily in trusting God. That is what God is calling me to do, to trust him more. I often say that God's got, you know, I'm supposed to accomplish great things for God, and I should do wonderful things for God, and, 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 and all these. You know what God's saying? Will you just grow in trusting me? All right? I'll, wor I'll work out the rest of what's going to happen. But you just need to, to trust me. That's what I'm calling you to do. And when I wonder how, okay, Lord, how do I grow in trusting you? How do I do that? I remind myself to imitate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, not only my Savior, and come and die for my sins, but he also lived a life of an example for me on how to live. I mean, everything Jesus did, he said, well, what is, I'm going to do what the Father says to do. Even to the point of being in the garden where he says, not my will, but your will be done. So how do I grow in that trust? How do I remind myself that I'm not God? Is I, I constantly say, how did Jesus do this? It's not saying I can't go to the town or I can't do business, but it's saying, how would Jesus do it? What if Jesus planned to go to the town, but then the Father said, don't? Do I become dis disappointment, resentment, or do I sit there and go, okay, God's got something else here that he wants to do? If the business plan works and I make the money, that's terrific. If the money it doesn't work out and I didn't buy any GameStop stock, do I sit around and get resentful? Why didn't anybody tell me? Or do I sit there and go, you know what? God's in control. The bills are paid. Things are being taken care of. We're fine. He says, the Lord wills. And then he ends with these. These are our last two verses. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. That puts in the slander and the boasting together. And all such boasting is evil. That's tough words right there. But he's showing you how dangerous it is. Because we want to think it's a small sin. He says it's evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now it seems like that's a change. Wait a minute. Do we just switch? Subjects here? No. He's putting it all together. See, sin is just is not just doing what is wrong. Oh, you did something wrong, you sin. Sin is also not doing the good God commands. And when you are busy over here slandering and boasting, then you can't do the good that God has for you. And what is the good that God has for you but to live out the gospel message? That is what God's calling all of us to do as Christians. But if we're caught up in here and we're caught up in the slander or we're caught up in the boasting or we're caught up in the disappointment or we're caught up in the bitterness or we're caught up in the angry, then we cannot be doing the good that God has for us to do. Because the last thing you want to do when you're over here is for God to call you to do good. And the last thing that's going to happen if you're busy over here slandering is that God will say to you, hey, I want you to love your enemy. 
I, I, no, I, I slander my enemy. I boast about me. I don't, I, don't, I don't love my enemy. And God says, yeah, I want you to do the love my enemy thing. That's why he ties that all together. Let me, I'm going to be honest with you. We live in a world that not only says slander is okay, it encourages it. It promotes it. It, it. To slander, to be able to slander someone is seen as a, a, a mark of pride in our world. Attack the person and take them down. You, you hailed as a hero for slandering somebody. And boasting? Oh, we live in a world that you better boast. If you don't toot your horn, nobody else is going to. So blow that horn as loud as you can and build yourself. That's what the world is going to tell you. That's no surprise you know that. You're encouraged to do it. Take down your enemy and build yourself up. And the Scripture says to us to do the opposite. To not slander the other person, and to not boast in myself. It's countercultural. And society looks and they say, how, how are you going to make it in this world if you don't slander other people and you don't boast about yourself? How are you going to make it? And we say, I don't need to make it. I know the one who's already made the way. I don't need to try to earn my salvation. It's been already given to me. And we look to people and say, there's another way to live that's different than what the world's telling you. Will you guys join me in a word of prayer? This morning, Lord, as I've, I've shared this, I can't help but think that there are some in our congregation this morning who bought into lies on how to be saved. That they think that certain clothes or certain behavior or certain organizations will make them Christians. Lord, I pray that this morning that they will see to the truth that those things do not save you. They do not make you a Christian. They do not make you a real Christian. That salvation comes by grace and grace alone, by turning from our sins and putting our trust and Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and was rose, raised again. And I pray for us as Christians who've fallen into the lies of this world that we must slander our enemies, that we must boast about ourselves. Lord, that we have fallen into lies of thinking we are saviors or we are martyrs that we overemphasize um, over our, our influence and our control. Lord, I pray that we will be reminded of who you are and who we are. So, the God, that we might really do the good that you've called us to do. Not the good we think we're creating to do, but the good you have called us to do. Let us live out the gospel message. And we thank you, Lord, that we are able to do these things not by our strength, but by the strength of your Spirit. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're in time of invitation. We invite you, if you have a decision to make, there's a perforated sheet. You can fill that out put in the offering uh, plates at the end of the service. Or if you'd like, there's emails and phone numbers. Feel free to reach out and talk to us. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond together? Take my life 
let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. some announcements from our very own Gary Pavey, everybody. Gary Pavey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I do have a couple quick announcements. The good news is this is the last day of January, so we're moving into February tomorrow, which is good news for everybody because that's one month of winter out of the picture. We're getting closer to spring, so that makes Gary a happy guy. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay, so as we know, last Wednesday night we got snowed out. Uh, it was really bad, so it was a good call, definitely for sure. But we are back this Wednesday at 6.30. We are having our business meeting that was scheduled last week. It's been rescheduled this coming up Wednesday. So this is a very important business meeting. This We're going to propose the 2021 budget. You guys are a huge, huge part of this church. You are the church of God, and we want you here to make help us make decisions we need to make for our, our financial matters. So please be there at 6.30 Wednesday. Uh, gentlemen. February, we got some big things going on in February. Uh, on uh, uh, Sunday, February the 21st, it's a seven-week program we're starting. It's actually uh, called uh, Kingdom Man. Tony Evans did this series, and he is a great, great Christian speaker. If you ever listen to him, he's awesome. They're doing a study that he, he put together. It's seven weeks, and it's for guys, and it's every Sunday at uh, 6.30, starting on the 21st. And the cost of this thing is only 16 bucks. All you do is buy the book. So it's a good deal. We'd love for you to come to that and check it out and everything. Uh, the next thing we're doing in February, we're putting together a meal for the Catalyst Mission, which is the old Haven House in Jerseyville, homeless shelter there. And we would love to uh, have you help us out with that. It's put on by the Great Commission team doing great things. Uh, if you're interested in help us out put this meal, uh, it is scheduled for Saturday, the February the 27th. Uh, please uh, contact Miss Kim down the front row, and she can get you all the things you need. The last thing, I was told to pass this along to you guys. We're in code red right now. Uh, we are desperately low of helpers in the nursery. So if you love kids and you love working with the kids, we love to have your help and everything. If you're interested in that, please contact Miss Nancy Shrimp, and she will uh, get you hooked up with everything you need. Okay, I think that's all the announcements I have for you guys. Let's go Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Lord, Lord, thank you so much for this time we get together to hear your word, hear the gospel, and apply it to our hearts and lives, Lord. 
we thank you for this gift to this awesome church, this awesome family, the love that we have for each other, and love that you have for us and we have for you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that awesome gift of salvation, the gift of grace. Lord, we ask you to continue to be with us, Lord, during these times ahead, these unknown times, these difficult times, dealing with the sickness, illness, financial issues, wherever it is, Lord, we know that you have that in the palm of your hand, Lord. You have it in control. And let us have ease in our hearts and minds knowing that you have this, Lord. We thank you for that. We ask that you uh, continue to keep us uh, safe in everything we do this week. These things we ask your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great week.